Our next panel is pa panel number two, charity. Whether and if so, how our tax laws affect charitable activities, religious institutions, and free speech. Those of you who have been living in the United States for the past five or ten years will remember on occasion terrible things will happen which will cause many people to lose their homes, their lives, to need medical care. Take as one example Hurricane Katrina. The water was still rising in New Orleans when people began on their own initiative to gather up food and clothing and rent trucks and head down to New Orleans to help out. People didn't wait to find out whether the contributions they were making were going to be tax deductible. Americans are just spontaneously charitable and helpful and immediately began taking action to help the people whose help, who needed their help. Uh, that is one of the inspirations for this panel. This panel is going to cover more than just those topics, though. And once again, we have uh, individuals here to talk to us about these particular topics, and I will let our moderator introduce them to you. Our moderator is Matthew Vadim, who is the editor of Organization Trends and Foundation Watch. He has been a research associate at the Capital Research Center. Uh, he also is actually a member of the National Press Club, having in a prior life been a journalist. Uh, for seven years, he was with the Washington Bureau of the Bond Buyer, a daily financial newspaper based on Wall Street. With that, he covered Congress, the Supreme Court, housing, and state and local finance. While a reporter for the Central Penn Business Journal in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, he won an award for outstanding legal journalism from the Pennsylvania Bar Association for an article that focused on employment law. He holds a master's degree in American studies from Georgetown University. Please welcome Matthew Vadim. Thank you, Lee. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I am Matthew Vadim, and I'm going to be moderating this panel. Uh, entitled Charity, Whether, and If So, How Our Tax Laws Affect Charitable Activities, Religious Institutions, and Free Speech. I am not a lawyer, although to my horror, I am often accused of acting like one. I edit two newsletters at Capital Research Center. Uh, it's a think tank here in Washington, D.C. that studies nonprofit advocacy groups, foundations, and the politics of philanthropy. Um, even with rising tax burdens, Americans are the most generous people in the world. Today, private philanthropy flourishes in the United States, a nation that Professor Arthur Brooks of Syracuse University calls a land of charity. Brooks, who is author of the book Who Really Cares and a noted philanthropy scholar, sees charitable giving and volunteerism as the defining characteristic of Americans. It's worth noting that in 2006, Americans donated 2.2% of their average disposable or after-tax income, which is a figure higher than the 40-year average of 1.8%. In 2006, Americans gave a record $295 billion, with a B, dollars. The overwhelming majority of this money, 83%, was donated by individuals as opposed to foundations or corporations. This generosity really shouldn't surprise students of American history. In his classic work from the 1830s, Democracy in America, the Frenchman Alexis de Tocqueville, a thinker now claimed uh, by both the American right and the left, noted the ease with which Americans acted privately in order to deal with social problems. Tocqueville observed that even though there were no great ancient repositories of wealth that Americans could turn to when times got tough, they were expert at creating associations to ameliorate suffering. But Americans' ancestors didn't have it so easy. In medieval England, the common law allowed benefactors to place property intended for charitable uses with the church or public authorities. It was a clunky, complex system of poor relief uh, that involved the monarchy, aristocracy, the church, local governments, guilds, and other bodies. But the massive social, cultural, and political upheavals of the 16th century, including Henry VIII's break with the Pope and the confiscation of monastery 
lands and all those things you might have learned about in, uh, in history class in high school, eventually forced changes in the way charity was administered. Elizabeth I's reform law, the Statute of Charitable Uses of 1601, was an early attempt at regulating charities. It specified which charitable purposes were acceptable and gave the state oversight power over private charities. It dealt with one of the key issues we deal with today at Capital Research Center, that is the issue of donor intent by attempting to assure, ensure that funds were used as the donors actually wanted them to be used. Um, the issues that the Elizabethan law dealt with, particularly what charities can do and how they should be regulated by the government, are still very much with us today. Centuries after the statute of charitable uses in the American colonies, churches were primarily responsible for poor relief. After the revolution, responsibility for relief of the poor began to shift and new players came on the scene. In the late 1700s, the founding fathers and the framers of the Constitution believed that the provision of charity was a private matter and that government, or at least the federal government, should stay out of the benevolence business. James Madison summed up this thinking when in the 1790s he told Congress, charity is no part of the legislative duty of the government. Madison was outraged by a congressional appropriation of a whole $15,000 for relief of French refugees because he believed it was outside the strictures that the Constitution imposed on the government. I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article of the Constitution which granted a right to Congress of expending on objects of benevolence the money of their constituents, Madison said. Early American opinion leaders believed that nonprofit organizations were part and parcel of a functioning civil society. These groups allowed private actors to attempt to remedy social ills without relying on government. This avoidance of government appealed to early Americans who could still remember what life was like under English tyranny. It appears this idea of separation of charity and state was so obvious and well accepted that it didn't occur to the framers to spell it out in the U.S. Constitution. The National Charter does not contain the word charity. It does not expressly authorize the expenditure of public funds on projects of benevolence, although since then the courts and politicians have argued, among other things, that the General Welfare Clause permits such spending. Of course, the debate over what the Constitution as interpreted by the courts allows uh, and what it doesn't is a fascinating one, but not one uh, that we're going to be focusing on uh, during this panel discussion today. We do have time to discuss charity and modern-day exemptions from income tax. Today's federal tax rules, like the statute of charitable uses of 1601, define what charitable activities are acceptable and also specify what activities should be tax-exempt. The private provision of public goods, such as poor relief, education, and the construction and maintenance of public facilities, can qualify for a tax exemption on the theory that the charitable groups are providing services the government would otherwise have to provide. It is deemed in the public interest for the government to go without tax revenue for such public-spirited projects. More than a century after the revolution, the U.S. Supreme Court got around to explaining the justification for exempting charities from federal taxes. In the 1924 case of Trinidad versus Sagrada Orden de Predicadores de la Provincia del Santísimo Rosario del Filipinas, 2631S578 through 581, the court observed that evidently the exemption is made in recognition of the benefit which the public derives from corporate activities of the class named and is intended to aid them when not conducted for private gain. The court elaborated on this thinking as recently, in, as recently as 1970 in the case of Walls versus Tax Commission. In a decision they upheld the constitutionality of the tax exemption for religious organizations, the court noted that the state has an affirmative policy that considers these groups as beneficial and stabilizing influences in community life and finds this tax exemption useful, desirable, and in the public interest. So with that in mind, it's time for this non-lawyer to introduce the three lawyers on our panel. At my right is Lee E. Goodman. He's an attorney operating out of the Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia offices of LeClaire Ryan. He focuses on a number of areas, including election law and campaign finance, college and university law, First Amendment law, nonprofit political activity, and taxation. 
Uh, Goodman has advised his clients on compliance with federal and state campaign finance laws, FCC political broadcasting rules, IRS restrictions on nonprofit political activity, and ethics and lobbying rules. He has represented clients' interests before courts, the Federal Election Commission, and other agencies that regulate political activity. Washingtonian Magazine named him one of Washington's top campaign and elections lawyers. He was also a senior policy advisor to then Virginia Governor Jim Gilmore and was chief of staff to Gilmore in his capacity as chairman of the Congressional Advisory Commission on Electronic Commerce in 1999 and 2000. Uh, immediately to my left is Kevin Seamus Hassan, the founder, chairman of the board and president of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. It's a bipartisan interfaith public law interest law firm that provides the free expression, that protects the free expression of all religious traditions. Since 1994, Hassan and the Beckett Fund have successfully represented clients from nearly every faith tradition, including Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, Hindus, Native Americans, Unitarians, and Zoroastrians. A frequent lecturer and debater, he has appeared in venues ranging from Oxford to the Vatican, from Harvard to Brigham Young University. He's the author of the book, The Right to be Wrong, Ending the Culture War Over Religion in America. Before founding the Beckett Fund in 1994, he practiced law at Williams and Connolly here in DC, where he, found, where he focused on religious liberty litigation. From 1986 to 1987, he served in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department, where he advised the White House and Cabinet Departments on church-state relations. And to my far left is Ann Neal, who is a co-founder and since 2003, the president of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Founded in 1995, the council is a 501c3 tax-exempt, nonpartisan, nonprofit educational organization devoted to ensuring academic freedom, excellence, and accountability at America's colleges and universities. Previously, she practiced First Amendment law at the New York City law firm of Rogers and Wells. She has also served as general counsel of the Office of Administration in the Executive Office of the President, General Counsel, and Congressional Liaison of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and editor of the American Bar Association newsletter, Communications Lawyer. Um, in this panel, each panel will have, will now take about 10 to 12 minutes to make their introductory remarks. This will be followed by brief rebuttals, rejoinders, surrejoinders, surrejoinders and witty repartee, after which the panel will then entertain questions from the floor. So first, I'll call upon Mr. Lee Goodman. Thank you, Matthew. Um, what you're seeing here is a chart that I'm going to speak from, which outlines the black letter rules of uh, internal revenue code restrictions on various types of tax-exempt organizations. Uh, as an observation, um, as a practitioner who advises tax-exempt groups, I, I principally get involved with tax-exempt groups who want to engage in uh, First Amendment democratic, want to engage the democracy in some way, whether it's educating the public on public issues, whether it's lobbying legislatures, uh, state or federal, or executive branch uh, officials for changes in the law, and of course uh, also engaging in electoral activity to influence the outcome of elections. Uh, I, I, I want to start, preface this by saying we're only looking at a small sliver of the regulation of nonprofit organizations. Um, the tax-exempt world is heavily regulated by a myriad of laws, starting with uh, state corporation commissions in how they form and their, uh, their if, uh, establishment of cor corporate entities, um, if they want uh, uh, lower rates for postal, uh, for, for mailing their, their message to people. They face a, a heavy layer of regulation by the U.S. Postal Service for what they mail and what they say in their tax-exempt mail or their lower reduced price mail. If they want to raise money from people around the country, they have to file registrations with charitable offices. Um, sometimes it's the Consumer Affairs Office, sometimes it's the Attorney General's Office of a State in order to uh, 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 qualify their bona fides with a state to raise money. And, and, and all of these areas of regulation carry uh, um, a heavy expense for, for any active nonprofit organization. 
What we're looking at today are, is a sliver of just uh, the regulation that is incurred as a condition of operating uh, as exempt from the federal income tax. And there are many other Internal Revenue Code restrictions on tax-exempt nonprofit activities in addition to the ones reflected here which, which uh, address principally political engagement. Now, uh, in my practice, I, I, I interface with tax-exempt organizations principally in two ways. First, uh, I represent 527 organizations. This is uh, Section 26 USC of uh, United States Code, Section 527, and those are avowedly political organizations. They go to the IRS and say we want to be tax exempt for the monies we raise and spend um, to engage in uh, express advocacy uh, and other activities to, uh, to avowedly influence uh, the outcome of state or federal elections in America. The other area, which is everything to the left of the 527 category, those are tax-exempt organizations that are not avowedly political, that is, they, they don't say they want to influence elections, um, but they uh, are uh, tax-exempt organizations that intersect with political activity in various ways. Sometimes it's legislation, sometimes it's elections. And the, IR, the Internal Revenue Code and the IRS have, have imposed a matrix of do's and don'ts for organizations based on which category they choose to organize under to claim their tax exemption. Now, there are three major types of uh, political activity that organizations pursue. Uh, one is the uh, electioneering. That is directly, what the IRS calls directly or indirectly influencing the outcome of elections. That's discussing candidates in elections, expressing the virtues of candidates, outlining the positions of candidates on issues important to the tax-exempt organization, all the way to doing what a 527 would do, um, and that is expressly advocate the election or defeat of certain candidates. There is lobbying. That's another area of democratic engagement that tax-exempt organizations often want to engage in. And the IRS has a technical definition of what is lobbying and what is not, but it's generally understood to be uh, either directly lobbying on specific legislation in a legislature, an executive branch, or in some cases, grassroots lobbying. That is, communicating to the public, telling the public that some law is good or bad, for the cause that the uh, organization cares about. And then the third activity, which is an activity that most 501c3s can engage in, and, and that is the, the, the bottom line you'll see at the left there, and that is educating the public on matters of public concern. And this is more general philosophical education, educating the public on what's good or bad about taxation, what's good or bad about higher taxes, lower taxes. The Federal Society, this symposium today, this is an, um, this is an educational symposium to talk about the tax code. So, uh, and yet there may be uh, a philosophical underpinning to that education, but it's not discussing specific legislation. Those are the three major areas of political activity that tax-exempt organizations uh, must manage in their, in their activities because they have implications for their tax-exempt status, and in some cases organizations can lose their tax-exempt status, in others they can be penalized by having to pay tax for engaging in certain activities. Let's look at this, uh, this chart, and I'll explain a little bit about the silos, because that's really what they become. Each category is a classification. When you form your organization, you have to tell the IRS which classification you're going to claim your tax exemption status pursuant to. And the first one and the most common one and the one that you're going to hear a little bit about and more specific in a minute um, from, from these two presenters is the 501c3. The 501c3 is the traditional educational, religious, or educational organization. And they get a special tax uh, preference, and that is that the others do not receive. And that is that not only do they operate on a tax-exempt basis, that is the income they take in, their expenditures are not taxed by the Internal Revenue Service, but the, deduct the contributions to those C organizations are tax-deductible. And um, under some theories, that is a subsidy by the public to those organizations, and as a result of that, 
there are extra restrictions on C3's political activities. First, they cannot engage in electioneering at all. It is an, it is an absolute prohibition. And secondly, they are severely restricted in how much specific lobbying they can engage in um, and, and there, they can, uh, it, it, the, the, the standard is it, it, it cannot be a substantial part of their activities. The rule of thumb is generally 20%. There, there may be more or less, and there are different tests on getting to substantiality. The next three blocks, C4s, C5s, and C6s, I'll explain what they are, but you will notice that the restrictions are all the same for those three categories of organizations. A C4 is, uh, is defined as a social welfare organization by the Internal Revenue Code. And it is, um, uh, the, the common parlance is an advocacy organization. These are organizations that avowedly exist to change the law in America or pursue some social agenda. Uh, contributions to these organizations are not tax deductible, but the income for those organizations is tax exempt. The C5 is a labor union and a C6 is a business league like a chamber of commerce. Um, NFIB, local state chambers of commerce, uh, National Association of Manufacturers, and, and you'll notice that, that they all are treated the same for purposes of political activity. They can engage in electioneering but uh, it can, it, it, their primary purpose has to be either a social welfare mission, uh, that is basically um, um, pursuing an issue agenda, or for unions, pursuing their union objectives, or for business leagues, pursuing the general uh, purpose of a business league. And as, as a non-primary purpose, they can engage in electioneering, uh, subject to another area of regulation we're not going to talk to uh, uh, talk to about today, and that is what the Federal Election Commission or a State Board of Elections may regulate for corporate political expenditures. But they are allowed to, to under the IRS limitations, to engage in some electioneering so long as it does not become their primary purpose. And then to the far, uh, excuse me, and all, each of those organizations, I'm sorry, can I... Okay. Thank you. They are they are allowed to engage in unlimited lobbying. In fact, um, many of them, especially C4 advocacy organizations, exist avowedly to change the law, to lobby, and change existing law in some area of interest to the organization. And then finally, to the far right, is the classification of 527. Um, you may have heard pejoratively of the 527s in the political system. Um, every political party organization, Democratic National Committee, Republican National Committee, every political campaign uh, in America, McCain for president, um, every political action committee you, you hear about, they all claim their tax exemption under Section 527. And they, um, well, you will notice what they are limited in doing is advocacy on issues and, uh, and, uh, and lobby. Because they go to the IRS and say, uh, we avowedly exist to elect uh, candidates and defeat, elected, uh, defeat candidates for office. And so fairly, I think, arbitrarily, the IRS says, okay, if that's your avowed purpose, then don't engage in very much lobbying. Your primary purpose has to be, and we're going to look at your expenditures to make sure that your primary purpose is that over 51% of your expenditures are on electioneering activities. So the, the main differences you will see throughout this matrix are different treatment for electioneering, different treatment for lobbying, and some of the differences are keyed on whether or not you simply get a tax exemption for your income or whether you're getting, in the, in the land of C3s, whether you're getting a tax deduction for contribute, whether the individuals contributing to you are obtaining a tax deduction. Now, a couple observations about this matrix, and, and these come from a practitioner in the field. These aren't highly philosophical observations. But first, this matrix places a premium for practitioners in this field and for people who want to organize these organizations at the front end 
for a significant amount of planning and anticipation of what it is they, pl they will engage in once they form their organization. And because once you, once you, declare, once you uh, invest your resources, your initial uh, con contributions into forming the organization that you choose at the front end, there are going to be severe consequences for what you can and can't do in exercise of First Amendment freedoms and engaging the democracy based on what you chose at the front end. And I often have clients who come to me and they say, well, we want to do this, but we're, we might want to do that. We, we might want to engage in some lobbying. We might want to engage in some electioneering down the road. And it increases your cost to plan around all those contingencies for what this organization may want to do. And in many cases, it puts a premium on creating several entities for one group of individuals, almost like creating a, um, um, a, several arrows in a quiver. You know, I, I often have or, or people who come to say, well, we want to engage in advocacy on immigration reform. And we, um, uh, we think we want to have some academic symposia on that as well. And some of our donors, it would be easier for us to get some donations if we could offer the tax deduction. And in some cases, we are going to want to support candidates who support our immigration reform position. And, it, and what it does is it increases their costs to form and what, I, what, I, what, what you would do is you'd say, okay, well, you need a C4 as the mothership, and then we will co-brand a C3 uh, to accept those contributions to put on your educational activities, and then we will have the C4 sponsor a political action committee, uh, a 527 to engage in the electioneering activities, and we, will, um, and, and we will organize you as three entities in order to conform to this matrix of the Internal Revenue Code. I have one closing comment, and, and, and that is that there's a, another observation about this matrix, and, and criticisms of it, and I think you're going to hear some criticisms of it. You know, many clients want to engage in several non-political and political activities, but they find these boxes drawn by the Internal Revenue Code to be highly arbitrary, to be highly arbitrary limitations on their exercise of First Amendment freedoms based on what code section they say they're going to be tax exempt under. And for many people, these boxes distort their associational and First Amendment activities. Um, they drive up compliance costs, which is a drain from their First Amendment exercise of activities. And in the view of many, it needlessly involves the government, the IRS, into meddling into their affairs by auditing them and investigating them into private associations and what many people view as innocuous First Amendment speech um, in the first instance just to police this matrix. So those are some consequences of this. Now in a minute you're going to hear about two specific categories. Churches who uh, face restrictions on their political activity quite often, it's fairly intrusive, and you're going to hear about a new area <laughs> of interest arising in Washington, and that's educational institutions. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lee. Um, next is um, Kevin Hassan for his 10 to 12 minutes of remarks. Forgive me for speaking sitting down. Forgive me for sitting down. I, I, um, <clears throat> 10 years ago, I got Parkinson's, and uh, I've uh, discovered it's good for many things over the past 10 years. Um, I can make a much better martini now that I have Parkinson's uh, than I ever could before. Um, it's a great excuse for a bad golf game. The uh, truth is my golf game is no worse than it ever was, but people point at me and say, used to point at me and say, would you look at that, he's trying to play golf. And now they point at me and say, would you look at that, he's trying to play golf. <laughs> and it gets you good parking spaces, but on the whole I can't really recommend it. Um, the point is, if I start shaking, it's not because I'm afraid of you. It's because I'm afraid of Anne. Um, the um, one thing that was probably the most um, shocking to uh, students of American history, and particularly to the students of American religious history, I think in the last century, and I'm not, I'm not trying to exaggerate, was in 1954 
when Lyndon Johnson, the Senate Majority Leader, inserted into this, the uh, IRS code, inserted into 501c3, literally in the dead of night, with no discussion whatsoever, a change in the definition of a 501c3 to require that the, the organization be one that does not intervene, and that was the operative verb, intervene, for or against individual candidates. What was so shocking about that was because in the uh, history of the, of, the, of the country, the early history of the country was not only assumed that uh, churches were entitled to tax exemptions, it was assumed in most places that churches were entitled to public money. Um, Massachusetts kept its official church until 1853. Um, Virginia was the exception. We were having disestablished uh, churches altogether, but in New, York, New York had no established church, but the rest of the colonies in, in one measure or another had um, official churches, and they backed them up with official uh, um, taxes. Um, now, those of you who remember first year con law realize I'm not saying controversial yet, um, that it's uh, the Bill of Rights simply didn't apply to the states until it was incorporated by reference, incorporated, uh, well, until by, until the Supreme Court put a square peg in the round hole in the uh, middle of the 20th century and, and uh, forcibly um, amended the statute, amended the, the uh, amendment without changing its wording. But until then, nobody dreamed that you could even cut off a church's funding, much less tax it. Um, and it was the second thing that was, was commonly assumed was that preaching had a political content to it. And there are literally uh, sets of, of um, the kind of books you get to put on a shelf and never look at. Uh, they have nice bindings. There are many of those sets um, filled with the, the political preaching, the, the, the banal political preaching of the uh, founding generation. Um, so along comes Lyndon Johnson in 1954, fresh from a uh, re-election campaign in which a couple churches in, in Texas uh, ratted on him for an, an affair he had. had and um, he literally in the dead of night changed the, uh, the, the, the statute to uh, require that the organization not be one that uh, intervenes. Now, nobody in the right mind up until that moment would have thought that you could take one of those historic rights of churches to preach and not to be taxed and condition keeping it on surrendering the other. That's to say you can either surrender your tax exemption and preach or you can surrender your preaching and I mean, tax exempt. Nobody would, nobody would have dreamed of that. And what I want to suggest is, I'm not sure anybody did dream of that. Because the language he chose, intervening, is language that works perfectly well for when an entity, like a church or a synagogue or a mosque, is itself speaking ad extra to society at large. That is to say, where St. Bevo's puts handbills out for the uh, public or, or uh, local gospel hour takes ads out on the radio or so-and-so takes a ad out and billboard out and, and says, don't vote for him, he's a heretic or he's a jerk or whatever. When the institution itself is speaking ad extra, then it makes some sense, at least it's coherent, um, whether the institution is intervening in a political campaign. At least it's coherent. Um, and it's probably constitutional. Uh, there's a famous case of Regan versus taxation with representation upheld this uh, scenario against uh, a free speech challenge. There's been no, uh, IRS has never gone to the mat on this question, so there's never been any um, definitive holding on the, on free exercise. but. The, the, the point I simply want to make is when a preacher preaches to his or her congregation from his or her own pulpit, that is a very different thing and doesn't rebroadcast it and doesn't send it on video discs and doesn't put it on the internet, but just preaches to his or her own con con um, church. Um, 
that's a very different thing from the entity intervening ad extra in the campaign. It's the entity itself speaking to itself ad intra. And um, being public interest lawyers, we are, are paid to cause trouble. Um, and we are uh, actively trying to goad the IRS into coming after one or more of our clients. Um, you might have seen the full page ad in the Wall Street Journal a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and what we've done is to uh, tape, videotape a, a sermon that we're confident the IRS will hate um, and put it, take out an ad in the, in the Wall Street Journal saying, um, if you didn't like uh, All Souls Episcopal, you're really going to hate us. Um, we, uh, let me introduce you to Pastor so-and-so, and he uh, said, I had to preach my conscience. It was a matter of elections, and I had to preach my conscience. He doesn't admit to anything in the letter, but in, in, insinuates very strongly what happened. And then tells you to go to YouTube and, and watch the sermon. You go to YouTube and watch the sermon, and every time he sneaks up on the point that the IRS is going to pounce on, beep, it's censored. And it's kind of cute in its own way. Um, it's also exasperating. You want to find out what it is this guy said. Well, if the IRS wants to find out what this guy said, we're more than happy to um, receive their, their letter of inquiry, which we will quickly return demanding formality. We're more than happy to re receive their subpoena, which we will quickly return, refusing to comply with it. Actually, they call it a summons. And, uh, and the rest of the world would call it a subpoena, but the IRS speaks as a summons. And um, get on with it. They're, they've never, ever gone to the mat at this, with anybody on this issue. And I think I know why. I think they really realize they've got a problem. Um, in a nutshell, the uh, argument is that the plain language of, of the IRS refers to intervening in this. Uh, a preacher's preaching on congregation is not intervening. Uh, second, that um, you have to construe a statute to avoid constitutional issues, and there's a constitutional issue here. Third, um, the regs are, are, are go beyond the authority of the statute. Fourth, um, it's unconstitutional. And fifth, RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which nobody ever seems to think of in terms of the tax law, which makes basically is a free exercise statutory right um, to uh, not have your uh, religious um, exercise unjustly or unduly um, burdened. So um, keep, stay tuned. We'll uh, continue pulling the IRS's tail until they either come after the Beckett Fund or they <laughs> uh, come after one of our clients and we can tee the issue up and get started. Okay, thank you. Um, Kevin Hassan. Next is uh, Ann Neal, President of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. I brought to my new program officer, Matt Mahwinney, who is a recent graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. He thinks he wants to be a lawyer, so I thought it would be particularly good to introduce him to the joys of CLE as one of his uh, first... Uh, first opportunities. As you've heard, I'm going to talk a little bit today about colleges and universities. Uh, I want to paraphrase Harvard President Lowell a bit. Those are the places where students arrive with so much knowledge and they take away so little. We're talking about a $250 billion industry, uh, 40,000 plus trustees, 4,000 plus institutions, 125 schools with endowments over 500 million, a third of the billion plus endowments are at public institutions. As you know, today's uh, program is focusing on our nation's founding principles, and it is important to look that since the inception of our country, the founders uh, underscored a very important role, obviously, for institutions of higher education to play in a democratic republic. Thomas Jefferson said so eloquently, a nation that expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization wants what never was and never shall be. The founders and their successors clearly viewed public education as central to America's ability to sustain a participatory government. So there is a distinctly American link between education and democratic citizenship, and I think that special link is what provides the rationale behind the privileged place that universities hold in American society and that we're going to be talking about today. 
Our institutions of higher learning have long uh, received public benefits, whether it's in the form of federal land grants, tax exemptions, student loans, scientific research grants. And while I know some people dispute this figure, uh, the higher education uh, establishment of the Ed Department does say that one third of higher ed support comes from the feds. Uh, it's certainly uh, the case uh, that these benefits are given to colleges and universities uh, with the understanding that the institutions receiving them who benefit from the autonomy of being distinctly non-governmental entities, 501c3s, that they will take these benefits uh, and fulfill their public responsibility. In essence, these benefits are given uh, with the compact that uh, our institutions of higher education will focus on the public interest and that they will be responsible for producing informed citizens, effective workers, and lifelong learners. And again, the reason I think we're here today is that there's growing evidence uh, in too many places that the autonomy that we're giving to our colleges and universities uh, is being interpreted uh, to mean freedom from accountability. Uh, let me just explore a few areas with you. Academic freedom is certainly a special concern of the First Amendment, which we're talking about. It's a bedrock principle of the academy. Uh, the original formulation of academic freedom set out by the American Association of University Professors in 1915 uh, clearly understood a recognition of the academy's obligation to the public. Yes, indeed, there was academic freedom, the right of professors to pursue truth wherever it might lead, but there was also an understanding uh, that this academic freedom meant uh, abiding by professional standards. Uh, academic freedom does not imply that individual teachers should be exempt from all restraints, and yet many in the academy today are suggesting that accountability to the public undermines academic freedom. And I would submit that there's a growing tendency uh, to confuse academic freedom with institutional autonomy and to confuse both with an immunity to accountability. University of Tennessee professor John Friedel he recounts tales of professors who think their academic freedom exempts them from basic reasonable professional directives, how to assign graded work, or what they must include in their syllabi to meet the pedagogical requirements of accreditors. I think it's interesting the University of California amended its academic freedom policy to eliminate the prohibition against propaganda in the classroom. The argument they had was that there is no real difference between disinterested and interested scholarship. Uh, the professor, David Hollinger, who is at the University of California, I think has actually rightly noted uh, one of the challenges. Uh, he says, uh, it's one thing to uphold the idea that academic freedom involves an understanding of the university as independent of governmental policing but it's another to suggest that academic freedom insulates uh, academics from ever being questioned, challenged, criticized, or held accountable. Now, as you all know, another aspect of the favored treatment of universities is um, the special tax exemptions we, we give and the fact that gifts uh, are also given preferred status. And I think increasingly there have been concerns about adherence to donor intent. Obviously federal policy is designed to promote gifts to advance higher education. Colleges and universities benefit from this favored status of donations. Uh, and in fact, uh, in 2007, nearly 30 percent of the total of largest of financial support to higher ed was given by alums. So clearly institutions are benefiting significantly significantly. Uh, yet again, there appear to be uh, abuse of these benefits. And I know um, many of you have read about high profile cases uh, some years ago, the Bass family when it gave 20 million to Yale for a Western civilization program, ultimately handed back to the family after it was determined that the money had not been utilized as the donors had requested. Uh, right now there is a very high profile case of the Robertson family suing Princeton again about questions of donor intent. Uh, so again, this raises some real questions whether or not uh, our higher education institutions are taking these 
disadvantages and abusing them. Judge Cabranes, um, Jose Cabranes in 2002 spoke to the National Association of College and University Attorneys. And while he wasn't talking about the tax exemption issues, he nevertheless raised, I think, a very interesting uh, point in this context. It is his suggestion that perhaps a limited but effective form of donor standing uh, might assist in these cases uh, that would basically uh, give donors an opportunity uh, to have an enforcement mechanism uh, against institutions that did not by, abide by their intent. Uh, with, it's his idea that uh, a basic floor would be established so that the donors would not be uh, bringing frivolous lawsuits and it would prevent them from using the donation as a way of gaining standing to sue over other unrelated issues. Now, the autonomy that we're talking about that the higher ed receives also uh, affects the governance structures. And I think this is an area that is getting some increasing concern, and it's one that the American Council of Trustees and Alumni is profoundly interested in. Uh, lay governance in the United States has been an essential part of higher education. It's part of our democratic tradition, and certainly in contrast to other uh, countries and other uh, states, we believe not in educational ministries, not in government officials, but that in fact our higher education institutions should be run by citizens. Uh, public trustees, of course, receive their plenary authority generally through statute, uh, privates generally through broad authority provided by articles of incorporation and bylaws. I think, and, and this is a reason I suspect that we're seeing more and more attention to this, is there's a unique challenge in the nonprofit world and uh, most particularly looking at higher education in that there is no real independent oversight. There is, shall we say, no real stakeholder as we would see in the marketplace. Um, there are no public disclosure requirements to speak of and there's very little exposure to lawsuits. So the kind of discipline that we would see in the corporate world we really don't have when we look at universities. And that's one reason, in fact, that the American Council of Trustees and Alumni exists because we feel that in, in an effort to find an independent voice and a stakeholder, if you will, that alumni are stakeholders, very legitimate stakeholders who need to raise their voices and that trustees obviously uh, can and should provide an important independent voice. Now, I know you all are aware that Senator Grassley and Senator Baucus have been extremely interested uh, in both nonprofit governance and higher education uh, generally. And in 2006, they held a roundtable examining legislative reforms that might encourage and empower boards to have more oversight over their operations. And this came uh, in the context of uh, various problems at the Red Cross and also at our neighboring institution, American University. And while I think that the legislative interest uh, is very therapeutic, and while the American Council of Trustees and Alumni uh, believes that the heavy breathing that we've been hearing from Capitol Hill can in fact be very helpful, uh, it's certainly our hope and uh, our work underscores this. It is our hope that boards of trustees will take on this self-policing that they need to do on their own so that they won't have uh, restrictions imposed upon them or various benefits taken away. I think in the corporate sectors uh, post Enron, we've seen a real revolution in terms of greater transparency when it comes to governance. And it's certainly the American Council of Trustees and Alumni hopes that institutions of higher ed and their boards most particularly uh, will have a similar uh, revolution. Let me just share with you something that I find utterly shocking. Looking at board size of the top 25 private institutions, the average board size is 46 members. Princeton has 40 trustees, Caltech has 77 trustees, Stanford has 33 trustees, MIT 74 trustees, Duke 37 trustees, Cornell 64, Northwestern 74, uh, Johns Hopkins 68. The list goes on and on. And is it any question, is it any surprise that with a structure so large that we are beginning to have more and more questions about whether or not academic oversight and other oversight is occurring at the level that we need. Even in the publics, uh, we can find similar challenges. North Carolina, for instance, their board of trustees is 32. Uh, and we recently had the opportunity to take a look and to recommend some restructuring there at the state level to a smaller uh, board of trustees. And this is certainly something that could be a ripe area of a review at the state level. 
I think one of the challenges is the confusion of governance and philanthropy. Again, I think we're all aware and no boards of trustees where big donors find themselves on the boards. And obviously that's very important for institutions and we should encourage uh, gifts to these institutions. But regrettably it seems that often uh, the uh, trustees are asked to be ATM machines and not much more. And I think that's something that uh, merits further examination. Uh, again, what are a few of the, the scandals that we've seen recently? Uh, compensation issues that were raised at American University, issues of excessive compensation um, by presidents and uh, high-level administrators at the University of California, cases where boards themselves admitted that they did not know the compensation of their presidents. Uh, the New York Board of Regents with the Delphi University some years ago, in fact, removed the entire college governing board for permitting enormous presidential compensation. Uh, so reforms in this area are clearly needed, and as I say, I hope that the boards themselves, uh, with the assistance of organizations such as ACTA and others, can, can bring about these reforms. Full boards need to set the pay for presidents and senior level staff. Audit committees should exist at higher education institutions when they do not. Uh, there are cases of consultants who tie fees to the size of presidential salaries. Again, this, this practice should be explored. Conflict of interest policies. We hear it in the corporate world. Uh, it's important, we think, for boards of trustees at higher ed to do the same. Trustee selection. I don't know if we have any Dartmouth uh, graduates here in this audience, but right now is, there's been a, a very high-level discussion about uh, the composition of the Dartmouth board. One of the issues there is that the president uh, picks the trustees and is in, in largely is responsible for the uh, governance committee. And um, there are those who have been arguing that this is an inherent conflict, that in fact the president reports to the board and that by designating the very people who will evaluate him, uh, we have a conflict. And I think it's interesting as we've seen some of these compensation uh, scandals arise that one one uh, one wants to ask, could potentially the large compensations which are being approved by trustees, uh, could it be part and parcel of the fact that they, are, they have brought in by the, been brought in by the president or friendly with the president? So it's a very, very cozy situation. And as we look at higher ed, and as we look at the Dartmouth practices, these tend to, in fact, uh, be counter to what we are seeing now as best practices uh, in uh, the for-profit world. The New York Stock Exchange will not allow nominating committees uh, to have CEOs on them. They must be uh, composed of independent directors. And so we think, again, this is an area where uh, the nonprofits and higher education can take uh, a page from the book of corporate governance reform. Um, finally, I think uh, voluntary public disclosure, uh, again, a very, very important piece that could be done easily, uh, voluntarily. We have been astounded as we've gone to public websites uh, to try to find even the names and addresses of trustees, and these are public trustees. Uh, we've been surprised to see that many higher ed trustees have no term limits. Uh, we would, would love to see voluntarily uh, boards increasingly to have um, information available to alums and taxpayers, uh, what their term limits are, what the attendance requirements are, what their attendance records are, what their agendas are, uh, what their minutes include. For instance, Dartmouth, and again, I hate to pick on Dartmouth, but I will today, uh, the, um, the minutes are sealed for 50 years at Dartmouth. That seems a little bit uh, uh, problematic. Um, are conflict of interest policies in place? How often does the board meet? Uh, is the president assessed and how and when? Uh, what are the compensation levels? Uh, does the board itself receive compensation and reimbursement? And then lastly, endowment, which of course has been very much in the news uh, these days. Questions of endowment hoarding. Obviously, there's been some talk of trying to impose the 5% spend out requirement on college and universities. Uh, what we are hoping and recommending is that boards of trustees take this as an opportunity to take a look at their endowments, to analyze really what is restricted, what's not, to see whether or not they can be utilizing these endowments in more effective ways that will benefit students. And so the long and short of it is we believe that the autonomy that colleges and universities receive through the tax code uh, has been uh, very largely responsible for many of the very good things about higher education. But it is clear that self-policing 
pricing is in order, it's clear that the benefits of autonomy have perhaps been taken for granted and sometimes abused, and so that it's incumbent on higher education to uh, take this opportunity now and the growing public concern and attention uh, to clean up its house. Thank you, Anne. I, I just wanted to add, uh, I remember from college, uh, the case of Dartmouth College versus Woodward, 1819, in the Supreme Court where New Ham the state of New Hampshire tried to take over Dartmouth College. So I can understand why they're a little uh, wary of, of dealing with the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. Um, I wanted to exercise the moderator, moderator's prerogative and just ask the first question of whoever cares to answer it. Uh, I wanted to ask, the, as Ann Neal just noticed, uh, noted, on the Senate Finance Committee, Chairman Bacchus and Ranking Member Grassley have been making a lot of noises lately about um, uh, the tax-exempt status of higher education facilities and charitable hospitals. I don't know if they're actually threatening to yank those tax exemptions, but it certainly sounds like they're spoiling for a fight. Do any members of the panel think anything will actually come out of all this noise emanating from the Senate Finance Committee? Well, as I say, I've been uh, pleasantly surprised that uh, the yanking of the chain has prompted some positive actions already. Now, I know that there are some who feel that what Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, et cetera, have done is not enough. But in fact, they have responded in terms of uh, student aid. And so, uh, as I say, I, I prefer the heavy breathing approach as opposed to uh, more government regulation. And I think we've seen some positive impact. And I hope that they will continue to have hearings and continuing to have, continue to have focus on these institutions because uh, in too many ways when they are ignored, they go back to their old practices. Those all the comments from the panelists. Okay. Can I throw in an extraneous question? What is what happens when the Harvard Crimson endorses a candidate? When the Harvard Crimson? The student newspaper. Does Harvard get does Barry Lynn right to the IRS and threaten Harvard's tax exempt status? Yeah, that's a very good question. They actually the Crimson would have its own C three. It would not be part of Harvard. The so they'd have to go after the kids. The one's the same. <laughs> So we still have 23 minutes left, so now we can take, um, we can take uh, questions from the audience. I see this gentleman has a question. Yes, for Mr. Hassan. About your ad extra, ad intra distinction, I guess I have two questions. One is about its validity, and the other about the extent to which your organization really adheres to it. About validity, the Pope's recent visit had him making appearances RFK Stadium here. It was a, a, an event that many took an interest in who weren't in his church. Um, I, I assume he thought both that he was talking to his own, uh, but that he was aware that the rest of us were overhearing. Um, and I think that that's just a, a, an extreme example of what I'd say is generally the case, and that is you really can't distinguish between the particular ministry of a church to its own people and its ministry to the outside, if it is of a religion that seeks to reach out. So I, I wonder about, even small churches these days have a website and you can download an MP3 of last week's sermon. So um, uh, I, I really don't, I, I really wonder if that's a workable distinction. And then my second question, which I'll go ahead and say now, and, and if you'd be willing to respond to both, I, I have the sense that if you got the system to acknowledge this distinction and say, okay, all right, for your ad intra stuff, you can do whatever you want, but on that ad extra, be sure you don't, I know you'd be bringing that lawsuit. Am I wrong? D d because isn't that going to be unworkable? The, the YouTube that you didn't like would still have to be bleeped. Under the I actually love that we, we, we did it. But, uh, Pardon me? I actually love the YouTube thing. We, we, we did it ourselves, but I, I get your point. You, you take my point, though. It, the, the, if, if Ad Extra were not permitted, then when you, when you downloaded to YouTube, you'd have to delete those things still. So the thing that is absurd to you and offensive would, would persist even 
under that distinction, or do I misunderstand? Well, you, you don't misunderstand the nature of public interest law, that's for sure. That's for sure. You don't misunderstand that at all. The uh, ACLU is uh, thinking several steps ahead uh, with, with every uh, suit they file. The, um, some of the folks on the Christian right are doing that. Uh, the Beckett Fund is doing that too. We've got our, our uh, secret strategies for re- uh, reconstituting the free exercise clause in the Supreme Court. We've got our secret strategies for uh, eliminating taxpayer standing, the last vestige of it. Uh, and we've got our secret strategies for what we do with the IRS, too. Uh, and I, will, I won't tell you this is the only thing that if we won this case, we'd, we'd uh, go off and do something else. Um, we do have uh, what our next move would be in mind. Um, but that's just the nature of, of, of the beast. The, uh, I think it's a legitimate point to say that preaching from the pulpit to one's own congregation is fundamentally different, categorically different, from the other sorts of things that people um, think of as a, as a campaign. And that is not only different, but it's, it's, it's very special. And it's, it's at the, the core of the free exercise clause in the same way as political speech is at the core of the free speech clause, or um, uh, commercial uh, um, Journalism is at the heart of the press clause and so forth. It's right there at the core value. And I think it's a, a useful place to start. And if it goes no further than that, we've done some good. But I think there's potential to take it past that. Now, that was the first question, I think. It was the second question. But which question did I miss? No, you, you answered the both. I, I just, I think it's a difficult distinction. And, uh, and I don't see anyone stopping there with, with the, the ad intra issue. I, I might add, I mean, what, what I understand Kevin to say is he's living like a lawyer. He's living in the framework of the law that, that, that the Supreme Court has ruled, that the condition is constitutional. And so Kevin is looking, like any good lawyer for his client, for the, the as-applied challenge that tests the framework that we have. And it sounds like a, a very credible case because there are thousands of cases um, well, excuse me, it, it happens quite often. There are dozens and dozens of cases after every election where precisely the scenario that Kevin has painted occurs, where a minister did use his pulpit and, and or a church newsletter to his congregation and discussed a candidacy. And someone complains to the IRS, and the IRS comes and audits the church and often it typically will uh, warn the church, sometimes penalize the church. I, I, not too many churches have lost their, their C3 status altogether. But I, I think it's a very credible st stepping stone given the, the lay of the law as it has, has been established around this tax exemption. And so I, I think what you're hearing from Kevin is he's looking for the most practical way to find the right as-applied challenge to at least create some safe spheres, saving, of course, the broader issue of large public pronouncements and websites and, and what have you. And by the way, the, the IRS does have guidance on websites and, and such things. If, if um, Senator Barack Obama's uh, uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who made a speech just down the hall a few days here uh, ago. You might have heard about it. Um, if he had still been an active pastor for United Church of Trinity, United Church of Christ in Chicago, and if he had made an endorsement of a candidate outright during the speech um, or urged people to vote against a specific candidate, could that have caused legal problems for his church? Probably not if he disclaimed that he was speaking um, his own, in his own personal capacity, he happens to be the reverend of that church, but that he, it was his personal endorsement. Where uh, ministers tend to get in more trouble is when they use a platform funded by the church, whether it's the pulpit, whether it's the church's uh, newsletter that the church has paid for, um, the church yard signs in the church's yard, you know, where you're using actual church resources, but, but there's a well-recognized exception where a uh, religious figure speaks in his own capacity. There was an um, investigation of Dr. Dobson's outfit this year I, um, regarding his use of the ministry for uh, something in the last election. And after the end of an exhaustive audit, they uh, 
said no, he's using a separate condo and a separate cell phone, I guess. And speaking his own name was sufficient to um, distinguish what his opinions were from the organization's opinions. I think that's probably pretty silly in, in, the, in the real world, but um, as long as they're willing to make such telemetric distinctions, um, we'll give another one to... Ma Matthew, your question raises a whole myriad of areas of specific exceptions, and, and this is one of the points I raised earlier about the distortion of the, um, of the tax exemption and the conditions on the tax exemption, uh, where uh, you, know, you can have a public figure come speak to the uh, congregation um, from the pulpit so long as there's no endorsement of the candidate and the candidate has an independent public office, for example, a public official running for re-election, and the candidate doesn't, doesn't mention his candidacy from the pulpit and only speaks in his capacity as a public official, or you can allow the, 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 the church or any other nonprofit organization can allow uh, candidates to come speak about their candidacy using the forum offered by the tax exempt group so long as they invited all uh, provided, you know, uh, roughly equal opportunities for all the candidates to speak. So um, 501c3 organizations have become fairly adept at um, using the exceptions, uh, and it's part of the, uh, I think, the perceived artificiality <laughs> of the rules that have been put in place to, to police the matrix that I showed on the screen earlier. And Kevin, you may have others that you'd like to reflect on. Um, I, I I just this is going to sound too cute, but leave it to only the IRS could have come up with that kind of a system. I mean, if if a second distant second would have been the DMV, but, um, <laughs> it's much more elegant simply to let churches and synagogues and mosques be churches and synagogues and mosques and preach their consciences to the congregations. I see we have another question from the audience. You do, but uh, just, this man's been waiting, but I'm going to take just a second to defend okay. the Internal Revenue Service who is doing what the law has charged it to do. <laughs> As you pointed out yourself, Seamus, th this is in the law. Now, the Internal Revenue Service is obligated by law to make sure that those costs and benefits that you have up there, you had on your, on your chart, you know, these are tax exemptions that are provided, and here are restrictions under which you must live in order to continue the tax exemption. So when the Internal Revenue Service has a complaint, justified or not, imagine the outcry there would be if the Internal Revenue Service did not look into it. And you use the word, the IRS is investigating. Well, you can use the word investigating. You can also simply uh, accept the fact that the IRS is doing what the law has charged it to do, and if they don't, nobody else does, and if they didn't, there'd be an outcry against that. So that's that. Your turn. Let's hear it for the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now the question. Joe Henchman, I'm an attorney at the Tax Foundation. Uh, it's, it's a related question also. Um, in his opening remarks, Mr. Vaden sketched out some of the historical justifications for favorable tax treatment of charities, generally along the lines of if they weren't doing this, the government would have to do it, step in and do it, uh, some sort of social work justification. Um, but as Mr. Goodman pointed out, there's a lot of organizations out there that are doing things beyond that but still get the favorable tax treatment. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of organizations in this town that are essentially doing political work while getting favorable tax treatment under the tax code. Um, now, no doubt they're creating some value for society, but I mean, the Apple company is creating value for society, but they have to pay their taxes. So my question, and it dovetails to the previous discussion, is is the definition of charitable organization in the tax code too broad? I'm glad I don't have well, to answer that question. I, I, uh, <laughs> um, you know, as a practitioner, I live in the world that Leo Connor just outlined, <laughs> which is the matrix, and I live in the matrix. Um, and so I haven't given a lot of thought to whether a charitable organization is too broad. I, I, I think it is useful uh, to go back and, and look at uh, some of the history of you know, how, we, how we got here, because, we, we, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna get to your point in a roundabout way, because I, I don't have an answer to whether the definition is too broad, uh, but, um, uh, Lee was right. This is the world we live in, 
and this is the law. And I think what you're hearing questioned here implicitly through some of these comments is questioning whether the law is as it should be in the first instance. We all acknowledge that the law is what it is. And one of the, one of the problems we labor under is really finding the justification for some of these restrictions, particularly in the area of C3, restrictions on C3 speech in the, in the political world. And um, you know, I did a, a, a so for several commentators published this, and so I pulled some of the archaeology of this electioneering restriction. And, um, and one commentator outlined that uh, in 1798, most churches um, were recognized as exempt from state and local property laws. And so uh, as, as the nation was founded, there was a presumption that taxes were not going to be imposed on religious organizations. And then in 1894, we had the first income tax on corporations enacted by Congress, and it exempted corporations, companies, or associations organized and conducted solely for charitable, religious, or educational purposes. So that was the first tax exemption um, uh, codified for charitable, religious, and educational organizations, what we now recognize as C3 organizations. In 1917, there was the first tax deduction afforded for contributors to corporations or associations organized and operated exclusively for religious, charitable, scientific, or educational purposes. And the only limit imposed on that was that no part of the net income could inure to benefit the benefit of any private stockholder or individual. That was the only limitation at that time. So there was no political prohibition at that time when the first exemption was enacted. And then in 1934, the first restriction on political activities of C3s was enacted by Congress, and that was that no substantial part of the activities of a C3 could be carrying on of propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation. Now, in an earlier form of that bill, there was a prohibition against, quote, participation in partisan politics. And, and that uh, restriction was taken out of the law before it was enacted. In 1954, with no discussion, no committee report, uh, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson uh, spliced in the first restriction on the electioneering for C3s, and that was a restriction on endorsing candidates. Now, when you read the history books, uh, some people attribute Johnson's interest in that to the election he had just been through in Texas, where a, um, where a gentleman named Dudley Dougherty uh, had run against him with the assistance of a nonprofit organization that was a, uh, it's been described in one biography as a sort of a neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic nonprofit organization that supported his opponent. And then he came and spliced it in. But there's no legislative discussion of that restriction. And then in 1986, uh, the law was changed to add, uh, uh, to prohibit uh, opposition to candidates because the law from 1954 prohibited endorsements of candidates. Now, in the absence of any elaborate legislative history, people have, you know, looked for justifications. W why we care? W why deny C3 organizations the ability to speak, exercise First Amendment freedoms, particularly organizations like churches? Um, what's the big deal? And I, I think the 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 the, the most widely accepted rationale for this is the subsidy or is the subsidy argument that we're giving a tax deduction for their contributions and therefore that's a subsidy of uh, electioneering. But it's not far fetched to grant such a subsidy. Um, you know, I uh, I practice in election law in the state of Virginia too, and Virginia has a tax credit for polit some political contributions up to a ceiling. The tax checkoff we all have on our uh, federal income tax allows us to divert some of our tax uh, payments to pay presidential campaigns. And the idea of a federal uh, uh, subsidy of other sorts, a tax deduction has been debated in Congress before. So it's not far-fetched. It's, it's, it shouldn't be inherently offensive to grant some subsidy, at least up to some limit. Uh, for C3 organizations to engage in electioneering with a tax deduction for the contributions that come in. 
There are other theories that get bannered about, um, particularly in the church and state area, and whether or not there should be church and state separation. And that's why we don't want churches to engage in political activity uh, with uh, the benefit of a deduction. Um, there's the um, there's the accommodation theory that we grant the deduction simply for there to be accommodation between state and church, but we don't want to then subsidize the church in doing that. Uh, then there's uh, the public service theory that we uh, we are really giving the tax deduction in order to enhance public services that the government might otherwise have to do, like educating people, um, like performing good works, serving the poor, and those types of justifications. Um, but I, I think the public subsidy is the one that's most widely accepted, and I think it's, it's uh, highly debatable about whether there's a problem with subsidizing First Amendment activity, because we do in many, in many respects. Is it my imagination, or does money keep finding its way into politics despite all the efforts to keep money out of politics? Well, I can tell you as a result of McCain-Feingold, uh, money has been looking for an outlet that is soft money, that is unlimited, uh, unlimited contributions by individuals and corporate money. Uh, before McCain fine gold, uh, large unlimited individual contributions and um, corporate money found its way into politics through issue advocacy. Those were the old ads that uh, said um, Senator Johnson voted to raise your taxes 100 times in Congress call Senator Johnson and tell him not to keep taking, not taking money from your pocket. And of course that ad would run right before an election and that was all permissible pre-McCain-Feingold. McCain-Feingold put new restrictions on those types of what we call electioneering communications. And as a result of McCain-Feingold and the clamping down of large expenditures of individual money and corporate money at, in the Federal Election Commission world, you know, in, in that sphere of regulation, uh, money, uh, large money, has been trying to find outlets in areas where there is a nonprofit exempt organization that doesn't get walks up to the line of Federal Election Commission regulation. And in the 2004 and 2006 elections, the money found its way through the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, MoveOn.org type organizations. Those are what I mentioned to earlier, the pejorative 527 groups that emerged. The Federal Election Commission has now clamped down on those organizations. Virtually all of those organizations, including the Swift Boats, have been severely penalized by the Federal Election Commission after the 04 and 06 elections. And so now money, <laughs> money is looking for another place to go. This is large, unlimited money that, that, that can't find its way into the hard money accounts of the parties and the candidates. And the principal place that, you know, uh, uh, I'll give you a free, bit of free legal advice. I mean, um, is the world of 501c4s. 501c4s, which was that social welfare advocacy organization category you saw on the screen, has become a place where large amounts of individual money and corporate money has been looking to go um, in order to influence elections since the 527 world got shut down and, and other soft money outlets got shut down because there was a Supreme Court decision in the mid-1980s, the Massachusetts Citizens for Life case, where the Supreme Court said that an organization that raised unlimited money from individuals that existed for a social welfare mission could nonetheless uh, talk about candidates. They had a First Amendment right to do that. And now there is an explicit black letter regulation in the uh, Federal Election Commission's regulations. And so I advise groups all the time that that's the safest place to go now if you want to spend unlimited funds to influence elections. Thank you, Lee. It looks like lunch uh, is approaching, so I want to thank you and Kevin Hassan and Ann Neal for participating in this panel discussion today. We're going to break for 15 minutes now so that the staff here at the National Press Club can prepare uh, this room uh, for lunch. And I've been asked to ask every member of the audience to take your stuff with you when you leave this room. Let's give this panel a big round of applause.